Welcome back to ECE 442-542. We're now in our second week, but only the second lecture of the semester. And coming up the next Monday that we reach, your passports will be due, and that's sort of the night that you'll be typically handing in homework, so I want you to get used to this Monday night cycle or sequence. Passports, you can deposit those in the assignments section on D2L. You should be able to submit those as a PDF file into that location. If you're taking this online, which now I'm talking to a different audience, but the online students need to find a proctor and submit their proctor agreement form also in the appropriate Dropbox in the assignments page or location on D2L. Show of hands, how many now see that homework one is posted on the website? Okay, some of you are actively checking. I don't think I sent you an email that I put up yesterday, but now homework number one is available as well as some additional resources at the bottom. I listed chapter one and chapter two. Those are chapters that I'm writing that now are published for the class and they are included in a couple of different locations. They're either in unit one at the bottom of the page or they're in the resources section. And if you can digest those two chapters, you'll be pretty good with unit one material is what I'm thinking. And that deals with first order and second order systems and higher order systems in chapter two. And learning how to deal with those in discrete time and manipulate those representations as either difference equations, state space representations, block diagrams, or transfer functions, and moving back and forth between those various representations. You should also, if you want, take advantage of the review material that's on D2L, and that has a long list of topics that are available. And if you're wanting reading material, most of that is available in the readings section of the D2L website as ebooks. You may be only to, able to read some of those online. Some you can actually download as PDF documents. But most of the material, you won't have to digest and read every word of every book that's posted, but I may refer to certain sections or pages of particular sources, and that's what I'm expecting you to at least look at when those are spoken about or referred to in an assignment or preparing for a particular class. Questions on the announcements? And please feel free to ask questions. I think some of you must be looking at the videos because it looks like more views have occurred than what I have online students. And you're welcome to look at the videos if you want. Yes. So the material on the exam, the question was, is it only unit one? It will be unit one and unit two that I foresee happening before exam number one. Unit one is on system modeling, and that's covering chapters one and two here in this material that I've provided, and unit two is on the Z-transform. So you'll learn how to do Z-transforms and inverse Z-transforms, and that's another couple of chapters I hope to make available to you chapters three and four that will be on. And I think right now exam number one material is available on the website and that should be located just below unit two. And we'll be sequencing through units as we progress through the semester. So unit z zero was the preliminary, unit one is now system modeling, unit two is Z transforms, which we will get to shortly, and then we'll have our first exam. have another page of goals. Those were the announcements. Now for the goals. We mentioned a couple of things last time and I want to just make sure that you have a visual image or something to stick with you. When we talked about an analog computer or an analog simulator, I went ahead and went upstairs in the fifth floor of the ECE building and took a picture on the back wall of ECE 530. 
is a analog simulator picture and I thought I would show that to you before we get much further and some of you remembered how to create an integrator out of an op amp I want to make sure that everyone's clear on that so that when we start talking about these all integrator block diagrams you go oh that's nothing more than this combination of an op amp or a capacitor and a resistor and that now is how you could ideally realize these integrators in case you wanted to look at integrators differently than from your math book. Now you can actually view them as an electrical circuit and you've now built up this circuit diagram that solves differential equations. It's a dynamic system. It's a equation solver is another way of thinking of that. We will then pick up where we left off last time and try to complete this process of transforming from a state space representation to a transfer function in continuous time. You'll want to be able to do that for discrete time systems before exam number one or by exam number one. Then we will get into the linear or discrete time setting by looking at a linear difference equation example and that will be a student loan problem. Maybe that's something you're familiar with, maybe it's something you don't have to worry about, but it's one way to start thinking about how do these discrete systems evolve in time. We'll look at it from something that maybe has a connection with you versus just a nor another RC circuit or some other dynamical system. After that example, we'll look at more general ideas behind solving difference equations and in particular we'll be looking at homogeneous difference equations which means we won't be driving them or forcing them with an input and we'll look at non-homogeneous difference equations and the distinction between those and how do you solve the two different kinds of linear difference equations very much like you've learned how to solve linear differential equations. Now we're just dealing with difference equations. And if we have time, which we may not today or tonight, however you want, I don't want to remind you it's an evening class, right? Somebody said, how does that go? And I said, well, the students are probably holding up better than the instructor. But hopefully we'll keep each other awake by the smiles, the looks of disgust, but hopefully not the falling asleep. I don't see anyone bringing a pillow just yet. So I think we succeeded in last lecture and if you're at home I guess you could have a pillow, you could have your feet up, you could have your bunny slippers on, it doesn't matter but now we are talking about the material for 442, 542 and let's now look at some pictures. You may not be able to see this very well but you can expand upon it when you get home when you want to look at the notes but you can hopefully see that here are some cables that are now interconnecting a circuit or a system that's now actually an analog simulator and that allows you now to essentially solve differential equations. So if you liked ECE 175, maybe we could have had a ECE 176 which now you learn how to program an analog computer and programming there is really interconnecting wires and figuring out what to do to set up a way of solving differential equations and if you ever get into 530 now you might just turn around I know those chairs in 530 are a little difficult to navigate in you may have to sort of bend your neck and try to find that picture on the back wall in 530 just as a way of connecting this class with something outside of class Here's the integrator. If you wanted to try to build an integrator, you could do that with an op amp, a resistor, and a capacitor. Now this is an idealized setting, but this is up above. The first circuit is in the time domain, and if you wanted to try to find the differential equations for that, you could solve it in the time domain. I like to just think about applying KCL at that node. The inverting node terminal and now I, if you look at what's happening relative to 
the voltage dropped across the inverting and non-inverting terminals, we have negative feedback, so that's ideally zero, and we are essentially having that inverting node at ground, virtual ground. Using that philosophy, we could generalize this and say, oh, what if we have some impedance in the feedback path, that's the Z sub F, and what if we have an input impedance, Z sub I, in the above circuit, Z sub F was just a capacitor, which in the frequency domain is 1 over SC, and the input impedance, Z sub I, is just a resistor R, and that's its impedance. But if you do the same kind of KCL at node A that I'd referred to before, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, you can refresh your memory if you need to, but that now allows you to find this transfer function between the input and the output, and because you now end up with this 1 over S in the expression, and this 1 over RC is acting like a gain, now you have this gained up integrator and you can connect these up in the appropriate way to start integrating differential equations. So that in the time domain, you really have this integral of the input voltage being proportionally related to the output in that circuit. So if we start talking about all integrators, you could see buried in that integral box, something like this, if you wanted to make a more firm connection with reality. If you just like to think of it as an abstract integrator, that's fine. Just keep it as an integrator. What I want to do now is quickly review and complete what we had ended up with in the last or the previous lecture which was this concept of transforming between a state space representation in the time domain, making that or putting that into a transfer function. How many of you have seen state space representations before? Did you do it in 320? No, you didn't see it there. Okay. So this may be new to you, but really just think of energy storage devices being what you can call state variables, so now you might think of inductor currents and capacitor voltages as being state variables in a continuous time circuit or in a continuous time setting in an electrical sense. But what we are assuming now is we've already obtained this coupled set of differential equations and we're writing it in this state space representation. We have the derivative of these variables in the state vector x, and those state variables might be inductor currents, capacitor voltage, it could be position, it could be velocity, it could be temperature. Those could be com individual components in the state vector x. And when I say how big is the state vector x, a lot of times I will simply say, oh, that's Nevada by, it's Nevada by one column wide. Nevada being N. Maybe you won't understand if I'm saying N or M, so a lot of times I'll use Nevada and Michigan, and now you know that I'm speaking of N or M. One way to try to keep track of that, because when I say the input matrix is now N by M, if I don't enunciate very well, or if I get a little sloppy, or if I get tired or lazy, if I start laying my head on the pillow, you may not understand whether I said Nevada or Michigan. Nothing against any of the other states, but those, I think, are distinct enough that you can understand that I'm talking about an N or an M. Then I may have to talk about a P or Pennsylvania when I talk about the output vector. That's all I'm going to worry about for geography today. Three states, maybe. And those are probably a little colder than what we're experiencing, although we're kind of in a cold state. We're in January, but I won't rub it in for the online listeners. But you can now interconnect, and this integrator block 
is more than just one integrator. I'm indicating that that is now a bank or this collection of however many state variables you have. If you had eight state variables, then you would have eight integrators that are really absorbed inside that one block. But this block diagram, this all integrator block diagram, is consistent with this state space representation that is now shown on the left and the right. And what we want to do now is this is a time domain description, both in the differential equation sense and in the all integrator block diagram sense. What we want to do now is take those into the trans into the frequency domain. And now I don't remember the rooms. I think we were doing kitchens and living rooms last time. Which one was which? Does anybody remember? Was the kitchen the frequency domain? No, that was the time domain. So we're doing the dishes. We're in the time domain. If we go into the living room, we're watching television. I guess we're in the frequency domain. Okay, so we're getting signal. Never mind. So here's our time domain. What happens when we Laplace transform? That's really what we want to do to convert this representation into a transfer function. And because we are only concerned with the transfer function, we don't have to worry about initial conditions. But if you remember, when you Laplace transform a derivative, that initial condition pops in there. You had S x of s minus x of 0 minus. And remember, this x could be 8 components tall. So this is now a vector. Little x of t and capital X of s. And I will try to distinguish between time domain and frequency domain by uppercase and lowercase. But if we Laplace transform, which is now off the screen, this differential equation, we now need to Laplace transform the derivative, which gives us s times capital X of s minus the initial condition, which we are going to throw away. And we can also introduce an identity matrix without changing any information, or we're not going to introduce any more or destroy any information by putting an identity matrix in between the scalar s and this vector capital X of s. How big is this identity matrix? And I'll tell you that the hint is up on the board already in terms of a way of figuring out how big that i is. How it has to be the same dimensions as the a matrix. That bracketed term that's now in black, this SI minus A, those two pieces that we're now doing algebra with, they have to be consistent or compatible. If A is N by N, Nevada by Nevada, the identity matrix I is N by N. So if you had eight state variables, that identity matrix I is an eight by eight identity matrix where the identity matrix is all zeros except ones on the diagonal. So you have one, eight ones in that eight by eight matrix, and they're all on the diagonal of that I. And that then puts the scalar S in the appropriate location when you combine it with capital X of S, and that now allows us to factor out the A in this SI minus A operation. We can solve for capital X of S by inverting SI minus A. And some of you probably have calculators that will do that symbolic inverse. How many have a 89 or a titanium? That will actually perform that operation for you. If you say invert this symbolic matrix, it will do it for you if you need to. We won't be going probably any bigger than an 8 by 8 inverse. So as long as you can do an 8 by 8 symbolically, you're good. I can sign drop forms now or at the end of class. No, we, probably, we won't be doing 8 by 8 by hand. 
you can also, well, that stirred up a little excitement, and I'm supposed to be jabbing you occasionally so that you stay awake, right? And that was my jab to tell you about inverting an 8 by 8 matrix. We Laplace transform the output equation, and we can then replace this capital X of S with what we know it, or we just solved it to be equal to, and now we have a way of relating or connecting the input, its Laplace transform, which is now represented as capital U of S, with the output Y of S. We wanted one equation that only had those two variable expressions in it, and C, the output matrix, is known or given once you have this state space representation. A is known, that's some matrix filled up with different numerical values that might be combinations of R's and C's or B's and J's, depending on whether it's electrical or mechanical. We have the input matrix and we have our direct feed through matrix. Those then allow us to factor out the input Laplace transform to produce this transfer function. And now if somebody, if you've now derived a state space representation for a circuit or for a mechanical system or for an electromechanical system, your very first homework problem is an electromechanical system. It's simply a DC motor and I want you to derive a relationship between the different parameters of that system. And you'll now simply parameterize that transfer function in terms of two variables, a time constant and a gain value. And that will be enough to model this DC motor. But somewhere buried inside that time constant and gain are the R's and the B and the J, the damping coefficient and the rotational inertia term in your DC motor. <clears throat> but if you now had a state space representation, you could turn the crank and simply perform this algebra. This is just algebra on the right hand side and boom, out comes a transfer function. If you had an 8 by 8 A matrix and you had one input and one output, this would just be a scalar transfer function. If you had no cancellations of zero factors with pole factors, you would have an 8th order denominator. You would have an 8th order polynomial in the denominator, but it would just be one transfer function if it was single input, single output. That's the review and completion of last lecture's material on going from a state space representation to a transfer function. And now what I want to do is get into a discrete time system example. And this is the one that we'll work through a little bit more at a more reasonable pace. The other was just a review from last time. Let's talk then about a student loan repayment. And let's be either, well, this is hypothetical, so whether this is unrealistic or realistic, you decide. I don't care whether it's realistic or unrealistic, but it gives us something to work with and something to understand how to play with or manipulate linear difference equations. With that being said, let's say that we have a student loan in an amount of $10,000, just to give us something to play with or work with. And this will then be our initial balance. or beginning balance, however you want to refer to it. And let's say that we now have an interest of 5%. And I'm not going to get 
fancy with the compounding, I'm just going to make this annual compounding. So this is now our annual rate of interest. And let's suppose that we want to pay this off over a time horizon of 10 years. So that's our time horizon. We have $10,000 borrowed or due when we finish our degree. Most of you may get a signing bonus and you can just get rid of your loan. That's fine. I don't know what you're getting now, but now all these contracts are flying around. So who knows? Maybe you're getting automobiles. Who knows what you're getting with a signing bonus? Maybe you get your loan paid off as a signing bonus. But let's say that you don't and you want to pay it off over 10 years time. We want to know basically how much do I need to pay at the end of each year in order to pay off this $10,000 loan. That's the idea of this problem. <clears throat> and to make that happen, let's now just put together some parameters. Let's just assume or let's just <coughs> identify some notation. Let's let the initial balance actually be P sub zero. And that subscript will be what we have at the end of each year. So this is at the end of year zero, P sub zero. And that we said was actually $10,000. And sometimes it's helpful actually when we're thinking about a problem to maybe sketch a picture or draw a picture of what's going on. And let's see if we can do something to that effect. Suppose that we now have this time horizon where the vertical axis will be the balance of our account and N is the time and we want to go out for a length of 10 years in time. So we now can subdivide our axis into 10 different segments. And obviously I didn't give myself enough room to make those uniform, but those are one year separations. We've now said that we're starting at time zero with a balance of P sub zero, our initial balance, and that's now 10K. What happens at the end of year one? What's going on? Can we actually derive the dynamic behavior of this problem? It's not a differential equation. This is now a discrete time problem. So now we're looking for, can we develop or derive a linear difference equation that models this system? What's going to happen at the end of year one? We have 5% interest. So we could say if we never paid anything off and nothing else was charged, we would always just stay at P sub zero, correct? If there was no interest being charged. But now we have R for an interest. So we're not only going to be here at, let's say, P sub zero, but we would also be an, an additional amount based on the interest on that $10,000 over a one-year period. That's the cost of that money. And we said it was 5%, so we take 5% of P sub zero and add that on to P sub zero, and that's our balance before we've paid anything off at the end of year one. So here, this would be P sub zero, and this would be, this little piece would be P sub zero times R. But what we want to do is we want to figure out how much do we need to reduce that. We'll call this sort of our input U each year so that by the end of 10 years, we've used the same U each year and eventually we'll get that down to zero. That's the idea. So that now, once we have P sub zero and P sub zero times R added together, we take away U and we're down to 
that point p sub whoops p sub one. Is that making sense? Then at the next year we would have well, let's write that down, maybe. We're now, every year, we're sort of assuming we're introducing this payment of U amount. So that's a negative amount counteracting or counterbalancing this principle with interest. And we want to know how big is U. So here is this minus U that we're taking away that will allow it, well, I don't know if, however you want to label it, but that's now the U that we're now subtracting off. R was our interest, and P1, let's say, is our balance after one year, and U is our yearly payment. And that's happening at the end and we're really trying to get at the question, what is our yearly payment? What's an equation that we can use to describe what's now happened at the end of the first year? Can we find an equation for P sub 1? And I would like to think that we did it graphically up here. We had our original balance, P sub 0, with the interest, so let's say that's now P sub 0 R, and then we say minus U. Does that look correct? Or this is now 1 plus R P sub 0 minus U. Do you see what's going to happen at the end of year two? Now you have P1 plus P1R minus U, so that we eventually get to P sub 2. And if you wanted to sort of make sure it's clear that you have something, some amount, you could make a stem diagram on this so that you now see that, oh, I'm at P1, I'm at P2, I'm at P3. And we want P10 to be zero. That's our goal. So that we're now down there at P10. What's the second year look like then in terms of P2, P1, and U? Same structure, isn't it? P1, then we have the interest on that P1 and we take away U. And that's our balance then at the end of year two. Or this is now 1 plus R P1 minus U. And that actually gives us a that's now established this general equation for P sub n as a function of P sub n minus 1 and the input u. Or our general equation that hopefully we can determine, let me say this is now 
p at time n plus 1 is 1 plus r, where r is our interest, times the previous principle, p of n, minus u. And that's true for n equal to 0, 1, 2, on up to 9. And when we get to little n equal to 9, we'll be at p sub 10, which we want to be 0. And I want you to be thinking about this many different ways, but this is now a linear difference equation. This you can now iterate to find the next value of the p. If you're given a u and an initial p0 and an r, you can now generate the subsequent values of p. What would this look like in a block diagram? Now, instead of having an integrator block, now what we want to do is have a unit delay block. Meaning, a unit delay is simply taking the variable and holding it for one sample period and then putting it out at the output one time step later. And going into that delay, let's say, is now p of n plus 1. What comes out after one delay period if we put in p sub n plus 1? p sub n is now going to come out. So that now, coming out of here, we have p sub n. And let's now assume that we have the input u available to us and we can measure p sub n. We can now build p sub n plus 1 from those two known variables, the input and the output. And we can now say, oh, here let's just put a summing junction. And going into that, I'm going to subtract off the input u. And what do I have to do with p sub n? I need to scale it by 1 plus r and then feed that back or add that in with the minus u to generate p sub n plus 1. Or here is a gain block. of 1 plus r, and that now gets input to that summing junction. So I have all of these signals coming into the summing junction. Those are the arrows going into the summing junction, equaling the arrow or arrows that are leaving that. All the arrows that would leave that would be the same. They would equal all of the signals going in. In this case, p sub n plus 1 is 1 plus r times p sub n minus u. And now you can see a visual block diagram description in a discrete time setting in the time domain of this linear difference equation. And what's the order of this difference equation? How many delay blocks do you see? One. This is a first order difference equation. As was this linear difference equation, we just had one delay in that or one advance in that equation and that's a first order equation just like in the dis continuous time when we're dealing with differential equations we had one derivative that gave us a first order or we had one integrator in our time domain block diagram that's a first order block diagram or a block diagram consistent with a first order system We still haven't found u, have we? I've been dancing around, drawing block diagrams, difference equations. Let's now use that information to try to find u. P2, we had an equation for. 1 plus r p1 minus u, but we also had p1 in terms of p sub 0. What do we know? We know p sub 0, we know r, we're trying to find u, and we know p of 10. 
P sub 10. Let me replace P1 with the expression that we had before, which was now 1 plus R minus U minus U. Whoops. Throw away the pillow. 1 plus R times P sub 0. So that this is now P sub 1. And if we multiply that out or distribute all of those terms, we see that we have 1 plus R squared times P sub 0 minus 1 plus R times U minus U. So here we have our expression for P sub 2 in terms of P sub 0, R, and U. And we're trying to find a way to get an expression that we can now solve for U. What would P sub 3 look like if we continued with this structure? Or what would you guess it to be? One plus R quantity cubed times P sub zero. Now what? Minus a string of U terms, right? But those U terms have one plus R raised to different powers. And you could think of this as saying, oh, here's a one plus R to the zero, is it not? Meaning, when you had P sub 2, you had a 1 plus R to the 1 times U and a 1 plus R to the 0 times a U. So that now if we have P sub 3, we have a minus 1 plus R squared U minus 1 plus R U minus 1 plus R 0 U. And now you can sort of see the structure that's falling in place as we increase or get bigger in little n on the left. Meaning in general, what would, so we could just keep doing that, but if we don't, let's say that we now try to generalize that for capital N. I'll do the hard part. 1 plus R raised to the capital N times P sub 0. And we can compute that number. We know little r and we know capital N. Now we can actually write this in a summation way. If we get clever, we can say, oh, this is a sum from, let's say, little l up to N minus 1 of 1 plus R to the L times U. U factors out of all of those, and now I simply need to add different powers of 1 plus R up to a power N minus 1, capital N minus 1. We know most everything in this, except maybe we don't have that particular expression, but you could sit there with your calculator or with your abacus or however you do this and generate a, a value for this bracketed term. Let's just call this S. What is S, which is this sum from L equals 0 to N minus 1 of 1 plus R to the L? And this is in contrast to what we might eventually see. At some point, we might actually have that upper limit on our sum being infinite. 
Right now it's bounded. It's a finite number. Little n is 10, so we're summing up to little or to 9 in this summation, in this case. So this is actually a finite sum. So you could actually do this manually if you wanted to. You wouldn't be there all night. You could add up these 10 terms, first term being 1. But let's see if we can derive a relationship for this. And now be sort of aware that I'm skipping a little space, so you might leave a little room on your paper before you write down the next equation. Hint, hint. I make students mad when I use the power of my tablet and make my page infinitely long or wide, and they go, wait! But now I'm telling you, I'm leaving some space for one more row of equations, and now I'm going to write down S, which is, in longhand, 1 plus R to the 0. 1 plus 1 plus R plus 1 plus R squared. And I can just keep going. That's S. We okay with that? Just written out. Now I can actually find a way to find S if I just realize that, oh, if I simply scale S by, let's say, this common ratio or this common factor of 1 plus r, I can now get two terms that look, or two right-hand sides that look very similar. Meaning, what if I now take s and scale it by 1 plus r? I now have 1 times 1 plus r, so that now gives me a 1 plus r. I have a 1 plus r times a 1 plus r, and that I'm aligning with what I had down below. Now I am going to cheat, probably. I'm running out of space on the right, sorry. But this is now 1 plus r to the n minus 1. But I have one more term, don't I? Because I have that times 1 plus r. So over here, I actually have a 1 plus r to the n. Everybody following what I have done so far? And what I want to do now is simply compare those two expressions. By compare, I mean let's take the difference. Let's subtract this bottom row from the top row. And most of those right-hand side terms cancel each other out when I subtract. What I'm doing now is I want to take this and subtract it from all of the terms up above. On the left-hand side, what am I left with? I have S plus RS minus S. So what's left is RS. I take nothing and I subtract one from it. And then most of these terms cancel each other out until the very last one on the top and it now, we take nothing from it. And so it just falls down. Or we now have plus one plus r to the n. Now I have a way of solving for S, a closed form expression for capital S. I can divide both sides by little r, the interest rate, and I now have an expression for capital S, which was that finite sum. And I don't have to manually add all nine terms. I now have S is equal to 1 plus r raised to the n minus 1 over r.
So for our problem, we now have enough information to solve it. R was 5% or 0 0.05. N was 10. So now we have S is equal to So now we can plug in 1.05 and raise that to the 10th power, and that ends up being something bigger than 1, 1.62889. And this denominator, do you see that sitting as 5 over 100 or 1 over 20? So we're just going to multiply the numerator by 20 is what we will do. And what's the numerator? It's 0.6288. So we're taking 63% of 20 is another way of sort of thinking what is capital S to get a feel for what should be coming out of our calculator. This now is what 20. That's the 1 over 20 in the bottom coming upstairs. So we have 20 times 0 0.6 2889, which is now 12.58. And that looks about right. 60% of 20 would be 12. And we're a little bit bigger than 60%. And now we have all of the information to solve our original problem. We want to find little u. What's our yearly payment? And we now know that P sub capital N is 1 plus R to the N times P sub 0 minus that sum, that finite sum, which we simply labeled as capital S times U. We wanted P sub capital N to be 0, capital N was 10. We've already calculated 1.05 times a raise to the 10. S was this 12.58, and P sub 0 was 10,000. And if we now solve that for u, that was this 1.6, well, whoops, 1.6288. So that was the 1.63, roughly. So now we have 16,000 divided by 12.58, or a yearly payment of And what's your starting salary? What's this represent? This is now your annual payment. You'll, you should be able to handle that if your loan was 10000 at the end of your undergraduate degree program. Let's say that you had $70,000 for your annual salary after you graduate. That represents less than 2% of your annual income is going to pay off your college. And what would 
So now you're making 70,000 a year after obtaining, let's say, a BS in ECE. If you didn't do that and you were selling French, you want fries with that, you were maybe making, what, 1050 an hour <coughs> minimum wage for 40 hours a week for 50 weeks, that ends up being $20,000. So now the difference between $20,000 and $70,000, I think you're willing to forego 2% or less than 2% to make up that 50,000 spread. Back of the envelope calculation. Now, what if you were thinking ahead and you were depositing money annually into some account in preparation for coming to college? So what if We actually saved a thousand dollars a year at two percent interest. Okay, okay, I'm a little optimistic. Somebody said I'd love to know the bank you're going to, but maybe I have a portion of it in something other than a money market. I probably wouldn't be Bitcoin. That would probably now be a negative 500%. I would get in at the wrong time, but maybe you pick a cryptocurrency that does explode. But what's the picture for this? Can you now draw a picture for this? Suppose now that we go ahead and start at the beginning of the first year. So at time zero, we put in $1,000. So here is P sub zero. So now we have a U bar, our input. What's the difference equation? that you're looking at now to derive or to find out what your balance is at the beginning of each year. P sub zero is a thousand. What's P one? And now we're assuming no one's take doing any finance charges on this. It's two percent flat, what's P1? What's the balance after one year? P0, which might be what you get now without much in. Sorry. But you're getting some interest. Let's call it R bar since it's different. And now let's deposit the same amount, which is $1,000 U bar every year. So that's the formula or the difference equation for the way money will accumulate in this account based on those parameters. Or 1 plus R bar P sub 0 plus U bar. What's P sub 2? depending on how you want to do it, it's just 1 plus R times P1 plus U bar again. And you could keep doing that, and now you might just have that already in your calculator somehow. P sub 8 ends up being $9,754.63. So in eight years, you've almost accumulated the $10,000 with what? A 2% interest, which you don't have to earn as much interest if you sort of do it ahead of time. What's the block diagram associated with this? How many delay blocks do I need in this particular system? 
to represent what I've now modeled as a couple of difference equations. A P1 equation and a P2, you see a pattern, I hope. How many delay blocks do you need? One. There's just one delay or advance between one of the variables and the other variable. So here we can say, oh, the block diagram, here is a delay. Here is P sub n plus 1. What's coming out of the delay block? P sub n. And how do we generate P sub n plus 1? Now we add in the input U, and we called that U bar. We had a different interest rate, R bar, but now this is a very similar looking all delay block diagram, but it now has a few different numbers, and you could generate P sub N for all time if you wanted to, starting at some initial value. And in fact, P sub 9 ends up being $10,949.70. So if you started saving nine years before you started, if all you had to worry about was the $10,000, you would have it in the bank before you started school. The benefit of saving before a purchase is another way of thinking about this. Maybe you've heard that already. Maybe it pays to save and then pay something up front versus having to pay it off with interest. Questions on those two examples? That should get you thinking about difference equations and all delay block diagrams, first order. Let's now look at difference equations in general. And it's easier sometimes to just go ahead and talk about this through an example. Let's just say that now we have x of n plus 3x of n minus 1 plus 2x of n minus 2 equaling 0. This homogeneous just means that there's no no external input or what I might have as an input might be U of N. No U of N terms. That's my homogeneous. It's not being forced. This will just be some system that shakes after being initially excited. It has some initial conditions and then you just let it go after establishing the initial conditions. In this case, let's go ahead and say that the initial conditions let's say that x at time minus 1 is 0 and x at time 0 is 1. And what we want to do now is actually find a closed form expression. Do you see that you could actually iteratively solve this? You could put all of those n minus 1 and n minus 2 on one side and just plug in numbers and continually generate the next x of n. So you could iteratively solve this. What's the order of this linear difference equation? It's second order because you have two delays in those terms. 
If you had to draw the block diagram, it would be two delay blocks interconnected in some way based on this relationship of coefficients and the terms. What we want to do in this case is actually find a closed form solution. And by that I mean I want to now be able to plug in little n or capital N and generate a number. I don't want to do this iteratively. If somebody says what's x at time 57, I want to be able to just plug in a few numbers and generate the output. Plug in n equal to 57 and boom, there's my output. Instead of iteratively going 50, 50, 51 and going through all of that. Now, in this process of deriving a way to solve this linear difference equation, do you remember how you maybe solved differential equations? You were looking for a characteristic equation in a differential equation. Well, we have a characteristic equation in a difference equation. And to find that, what we will do is we're just going to assume a generic structure for the solution. And then we'll see if that will produce a characteristic equation. Let's now assume a form for the solution so that what we will do is let's just say that little x of n is now a z to the n. That's the structure that we want, are assuming. So x of n is going to be a constant a times some variable z raised to the nth power. That's our assumed structure where this a is a constant. It's not a matrix. It's just a constant. So you'll see that I overuse a lot of variables. A and z in this assumed solution form are values that we need to determine, that need to be determined. If you're trying to replay what you've seen from earlier classes, if you're now thinking back to, oh gosh, characteristic equation, what? If you're thinking about differential equations, you might compare this structure AZ to the N with what you might have assumed for a structure in a differential equation class where you might have said, oh, let me say A, E, and S is now a variable T. This is what you might have assumed for a generic structure or solution for a continuous time differential equation solution. And you can find this same structure AZ to the N if you simply sample that AE to the ST but we won't do that. We'll sample in a little bit later. But now we are starting explicitly with a difference equation. If I now use this assumed structure, a z to the n, in our governing difference equation, I now need to replace little n with an n, an n minus 1, and an n minus 2 with these coefficients x of n, I already know. That's a z to the n. Then I take 3 times that x of n, but it's now x of n minus 1. Or that's now a z to the n minus 1. So this was just the x of n This was 3x of n minus 1, and what was my last piece? 
2, x of n minus 2, so that's going to be 2 and that equals 0. I can now factor out some common terms from that collection of three terms. What's common to all of those? I could factor out an a, z to the n minus 2 from all three of those terms. What happens when I factor a, z to the n minus 2 out of that first term? What would I have to multiply here in order to produce a, z to the n? z squared. What about the next one? The a's been pulled out. I don't have to worry about that. The 3 is staying, but now I just have to multiply that by z. Plus 2, and I factored out the a, z to the n minus 2. and voila, now I have what I was told I might be looking for, which is a characteristic polynomial in terms of this unknown variable z, and if I now set this characteristic polynomial equal to zero, this now gives me what I will call a characteristic equation. or I now need to solve z squared plus 3z plus 2 equaling 0. And maybe, even though it's late, maybe you can still factor that. We don't have to use the quadratic formula. I just came from a meeting and they were saying, well, some of these students may not not you, but freshmen might not know how to use the quadratic formula. You could use that to solve this, or if you're still somewhat awake, you could say, oh, that factors into two linear factors, a z plus 1 and a z plus 2. So that the solution, or solving that characteristic equation, now allows me to find two different values of z. And that's what I would have expected since it was a second order difference equation. I was looking for two different values of z. They could have been complex. They would be conjugates, complex conjugates, but they could have been complex conjugates. Here, if I solve that... z equal to minus 1 and z equal to minus 2. And now I know the generic structure of my solution. x of n is going to be made up of a linear combination of those two modes. Now I move or I shake with a mode of minus 1 and another mode of minus 2. And I combine those, and I say a1 minus 1 to the n plus a sub 2 minus 2 to the n. And how do I find my a1 and a2? The initial conditions. If I had driven this, if I had a non-homogeneous, I wouldn't solve for these initial conditions yet. I would find my com total solution and then put that in or use that to find my initial, or use that with my initial conditions to find the unknown coefficients. But now I can find a1 and a sub 2 from the initial conditions. x of 0 was 1. So 
so that now I have one equation that says a1 plus a2 is equal to 1 and x of minus 1 was 0 so that now I have a1 minus 1 to the minus 1 plus a sub 2 minus 2 to the minus 1 and I can now I have two equations in two unknowns. I'll let you solve those two equations in two unknowns and find what little x of n is, and that's our closed form solution for that linear difference equation.